everybody and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the map round show this is hold my beer series and i've as always got my mates rich and brent spilly welcome back to the show good morning matt ahoy yeah sorry about the fuck up this morning it's gonna be a shorter episode than usual but, but anyway i actually want to actually want to point out that you really do have like the, the puffy sleepy eyes still hey? like you really <sighs> Dude, don't oversleep you I you. Matt up. <laughs> 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 it's a winter morning in colorado and we got him out of a very cozy bed <laughs> it was so cozy it was so cozy um but uh, how you guys been you been good yeah good we've uh you know we had we had we, we had for the, the SA listeners, everyone gets this, but if people overseas, South Africa shuts down over December. So we've come out of that hibernation of nothing is actually functionally working in this country. But it seems to be back with the, the vengeance, which is quite nice, actually. I was saying to Brent while we were chatting, though, this is one of the first years where usually I have my holiday, I feel great, I get back to work, I turn it on, it's amazing. This year I came back, and I think it's to do with still working from you know my office at home and alone. And this was the first year I came back and I actually thought, oh, I'm over it. I, I need humans. And I, you know, I'm an introvert. I didn't think I wanted that. But I did. It's the first time I came back and thought, well, I've been, I've been by myself, for myself, for weeks. Now I want to be surrounded by people. I want to be busy again. And, and I just felt a bit of a slump. Mm. Okay. What did you, you do over the festive season, Brent? Did you travel? So my wife is, is, is due in about two to three weeks, depending on the day of the week at the moment. So, so uncomfortable, uh, very pregnant, stereotypically waddling around. And um, so we're not flying anywhere. We can't do long road trips because not comfortable. So we did three nights at the Cradle Boutique Hotel in the, the Cradle of Mankind, which is 45 minutes away. And it was great. The weather was spectacular. We had a pool downstairs. We stayed in a little like lodgy vibe three course meals and just three nights. Wonderful. And then we came back to the reality that I'm moving house and we started, we say we, I started packing boxes and systematically just three or five boxes a day, just every day. And uh, by the time we had to move, most of it was done. And, you know, fortunately we have great labor in this country and uh, my domestic helps pack up all the, the small bits and pieces and it wasn't as traumatic. And, and I've done the move uh, house in Joburg to apartment in Joburg, apartment in Joburg to house in Cape Town, house in Cape Town to apartment in Joburg. Now I moved again in four years and sold my holiday home, moved that to Cape Town. So we are experts at packing up and moving houses. I should start a service. Peace. That's not tough. fun. Not fun. Doesn't yeah. sound fun. And Rich, how about you? I was very chilled. You know, I, I, I travel for a living. So uh, mine was like books, board games, and boxes because we're moving as well. So uh, uh, those were the kind of the three things. But it was really nice. I actually very very enjoyed it. Uh, we chose to be very methodical about it and do everything slowly and protracted. Uh, the only the only kind of thing I'm, I'm definitely not the boss of anything. But the only thing that I insisted on is I didn't want furniture to leave while I was still on holiday. I wanted to enjoy my holiday. So we like did help. We packed up the kind of a lot of books and comics and stuff we wanted to sell, but the furniture had to stay for the whole holiday. It's only now that it's starting to go. Mm. Have you done a, a massive like uh, a clearance of rubbish that you've collected over the years? Yeah, it's, luckily we don't have a ton, but but it, but of oh, rubbish. Like we've, I guess we've curated to a degree. Although I mean, I, I sold like four big, big, big boxes of board games. Uh, you know, worth like, I don't know, a small fortune, but, uh, it was, it feels cathartic, doesn't it? It's actually amazing. Absolutely. Like Matt, amazing. I imagine when you left, there's that, the first thought is take everything. And then you think about it and you thought, well, hold on a second. And it's really nice deciding which, what is ghost of Richard past, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, that stuff I want to let go of. And it's, I thought it was really, really interesting. Matt, what was it like yeah. for you guys? Like, to jump yeah. in and then you can tell us about your Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it was the same, man. It was well when we just just on the stuff, the material things. We basically sold everything, like everything. If it wasn't sentimentally uh, valuable, uh, we uh, then we sold it. Or if it wasn't something that we would need, you know, the moment that we landed on the ground in the US. Uh, but uh, yeah, my my season, festive season was really great. Uh, socially, I'm also an introvert, not not exactly my best thing, but kind of seemingly getting over myself. Uh, but uh, the winter here is tough, man. Uh, it was like minus 24. That's like minus, I don't even know, it's like minus 8F or something like that. Um, 
and like just brutally, brutally, proper, brutally cold. Proper, yeah, properly man. cold. <laughs> yeah, like lots of snow. Um, you know, you kind of feel like you're housebound a lot, you know. So that access thing that I had in summer when we're, you know, we're talking about motorbikes, you know, I like to ride my KT about in the mountains and stuff. Like I feel like I've lost that, you know. Um, and so it's, it's, it's it also, you know, it's only the second winter. So maybe it gets easier, but I kind of feel like there's this uh, adversity, you know, that I'm kind of having to deal with in the winter, you know, because it's tough, man. You either have to play ice hockey or you have to go out into the mountains and snowboard and ski. But that's also like uh, fraught with like <laughs> problems, you know, because when it's so hectic, the weather out in the mountains, like so many people come to uh, Colorado for the mountains to go snowboarding and skiing and they shut down a lot of the roads. Um, so your travel time can go from what's typically like an hour and a half to 10 hours there's avalanches mm -hmm. coming down the mountains and crossing the roads and so you know it's it's uh, it's not as accessible as i feel like it should be you know what i mean yeah i think i think there's a lot to this 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 word that adversity uh, as an idea be, uh, be, uh, as entrepreneurs obviously like it's amazing have you ever found it like that's that's what i'm lacking at the moment uh mm -hmm. I'm I'm two Watch years it. after COVID. COVID was adverse, and adverse was exciting, and it was something for me to solve. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like stagnant. Like there's something about a mindset around adversity uh, that that we need to have, you know. And I'm obviously facing this in a few weeks, in three weeks. Brent is in the middle of this now. This entrepreneurial embrace embracing of adversity. Yeah, I think also Christian, going into the new year right uh, sorry but mm. going into the new year it's like you you disconnect i felt like really disconnected you know from the war that is building a business every day um and then like when you go back into the new year it's like fuck now you're back into this whole adversity sort of mindset again you know um sorry Brent, so you were going to say something so, so the, way, also the way hang you, that up. yeah yeah the way you framed that rich it sounds as though adversity is a goal post that we're aiming for as entrepreneurs potentially because we actually thrive on the stress I, th I think i say we a lot of a lot of business owners actually go go searching for that stress so they create adversity because that's what fuels them right and when, when things are good and calm and actually working well that's when they start flapping they're like like i feel like i'm not needed or where's the challenge or it becomes this this, this thing where we, we chase the adrenaline and it, it almost sounded though like you were saying adversity is something we're actually moving towards deliberately because that's where the growth is. So we talked about, you know, you, growth is where the pain is. It, well, yes. Yeah, so so there's different kinds of well, phrasing for adversity, I suppose. Right? It's very, very right. hard. It's very hard to grow when you're sitting on a, a heated toilet playing, you know, games mm -hmm. on, on your phone and stuff like this. The But, yeah, I, I guess it's not for everybody, but... You know, I'm moving to the Isle of Man. We're going to be, I'm going to be, I, I commuted for 10 years between Joburg and Cape Town. I'm now going to be doing that between the Isle of Man and South Africa. You know, so I, I've already been, you know, I'm, I'm going in February. I'm coming back in March, coming back in April, but uh, it's going to be cold. And we had this mindset around it because I started to think about the cold and we're planning for like, ah, oh, you know, but summer's coming. And I thought, this is a terrible mindset. Okay, nobody in Scandinavia sits there. Uh, I was chatting to my friend Neil and we were talking about this and Nobody in Scandinavia, in Denmark and Sweden, sit there waiting for summer. Winter isn't to be uh, endured. It's to be enjoyed. This is my mindset. And I think this is exactly the same for uh, uh, adversity. Adversity isn't to be endured. It's to be enjoyed. You will think we, we're not trying to, and maybe it's not about looking for it, but it's about mm. when it arrives, embracing it and, mm. and saying, okay, so how can I turn this into something I enjoy? And there's a, a very, very quick point i'm going to throw it back to you i think i told you guys about that horrific trip i had uh where my flight got canceled my luggage got lost when i was flying to the u.s to toronto last year and my my thing that whole day was upa my I always when i travel my travel resolution is always upa unconditional positive attitude and everything went wrong like everything went wrong and i just laughed it off the whole day and it couldn't have got worse and worse and worse but then people just started reaching out and saying, how can we help you? People were offering to drive from Canada to the States and pick me up. And other people were going to drive me to the border and things. And it was just amazing. And at the end of the day, at like it was like one in the morning. I got to the hotel I should have got to at like 10 in the morning. And I just thought, I, I live an amazing life. 
first of all, I'm able to do all of this stuff. And second of all, this was one of the best days of my life. On reflection, it was so amazing. And I didn't, br I didn't lose my smile once because adversity is to be enjoyed. If, if the moment you forget that, then your mindset, you go into anger and excuses and shit. And I think it's bad. People I think, don't I think like I adversity like... though here. Like they yeah. don't. I, I, I mean, they, they want, hmm. they, they, I think there's this, there's a, there's, I think entitlement plays a role in this whole sort of discussion where, you know, you, you, so I, I, I write, wrote about this in my first book, you're in a game, but, and I think, um, Rich, I've heard you say the same thing, but, you know, if you think about uh, Silicon Valley and TechCrunch and the headlines around, you know, these startups raising money with like billion, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars at ridiculous valuations, I mean, they don't even have revenue, you know, uh, and things like this. And it creates this perception that when you found a startup that you can create incredible amounts of wealth in a very short amount of time. And so that perception for me creates entitlement. So then actually you six months in or maybe you nine months into your startup journey and it fucking sucks and you can't find product market fit you're battling to raise money you're feeling like an imposter um, and so adversity now is a real problem for you because you're you felt like you were entitled to success and you underestimated exactly how hard it was going to be and this is especially true for like first-time founders you know so like for every one of those headlines there's hundreds of thousands of crushed dreams you know what i mean um, and so this idea of like adversity, especially for younger entrepreneurs, for me, um, is, is a big one. That's amazing. Brent? I, I was going to say that, that there's obviously different kinds of adversity, right? So there's like life-threatening, horrific kind of adversity. And then there's the, the grind of my clients haven't paid me. Uh, you know, in this country, we have load shedding. There's no power. And how do we deal with that? So there's like levels of adversity, I think, which is important. To, and so embracing adversity within reason, obviously, it's, it's like, you know, when you, dear auntie's got, you know, stage two brain cancer, she doesn't, I'm going to embrace the adversity. No, you're not, right? Like, let's be realistic about it. Like, oopa, you can try that, but sometimes it's, it's, it's more difficult than other times. So within reason, but Rich, Rich and I were talking about the fact that we moved into our house and realized the house wasn't ready or had problems with it. So we literally within one day, Matt, we packed up a house over the period, moved in, unpacked started unpacking boxes and the next day packed up those boxes and then moved out right like like and for me there was a moment where whatever the the opposite of upa is richard that was me for 48 hours like the world was collapsing okay and then we we booked ourselves into these this amazing 20 20 st story airbnb with the pool and the roof and this amazing view Matt, of sunset those are the pictures on the chat on yeah. the whatsapp okay. group right and right. and and what i saw was the joy that my daughter had. Now, I was irritated that we weren't staying in the house from interstate, and I was irritated we were paying a couple of bucks for this, this Airbnb for however long it was going to take. And I was just super frustrated and, and, and aggravated and friction and all those negative words. And my daughter was like, we're on holiday. We got this amazing pool on the roof. Look at the sunset, Dad. Oh, my God, look at the sky. And, she was and Upa. She was Upa, right? And, and yes, she wasn't paying the bill, okay, like point, point that out, but... The fact is, is that it's it's about perspective, perspective, right? So it's about going. And I was saying to Richard that I had a client come back from one of the the, the rah rah Tony Robbins things, and and the language that he was using a lot was, "I get to do things, not I have to do things." And it's I get to stay in this amazing Airbnb with this amazing view. And my daughter thinks we're on holiday. Versus, oh, I have to. I can't stay at home. I have to. And so the Uber thing is very much around the language we tell ourselves and and how we set that frame of mind. I'm not by any means preaching this because I am terrible at this. I, I, like, I, I'm Mr. Realist, negative, pessimist, without question on most things. But it's interesting the fact that you can take it a, a bad situation and if you've got the means or the mindset, you can definitely change the, the way it feels to you for a period of time and the people around yeah. you. One of the things is, is to predict it, right? So, so you guys know I set a new day resolution every day. And so today I was doing a, a talk out at Hasendal and it was to use no F-bombs. And, you know, I got my tick. And on days I'm traveling far, when I know there's a likelihood of bad things, my goal for the day is UPA. And because I am goal-driven, I want to check off my new day resolution. So because I predicted this could be a stressful day, it's like it's gone from me. So it's not to say that I don't get thrown when, when unanticipated shit comes up, but mm -hmm. it's that I do my best to, to try and look for uh, 
uh, moments that are likely to be difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I kind of try to put that there. But it's funny, just go back to Matt's point about entitlement. I think it's amazing. I think it's absolutely true. And I, I, I read why I spat back a highlight to me this morning in my morning reads. And have you, any of you read Trejo, the book by Danny Trejo, T-R-E-J-O? He's a machete. You know who he is? No. Machete. You don't know who Danny Trejo is? <laughs> no. You keep repeating this, Google, no? Google Trejo. He's like a... How do you spell T -R -T -R -E -J -O. that? T-R-E-J-O. This is unacceptable. You, there's no doubt in my mind that you know who he is. Don't know who uh, he is. Danny Trejo. Why didn't you say so? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Do you know who he is? Okay, sure. Oh, of right? you know who he is. Everybody knows who <laughs> Danny Trejo is. He's amazing. Like, I love him. He is machete. Anyway, so Danny Trejo writes. Do you know his whole story, by the way? It's fascinating. His, his biography is brilliant. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. He was like a proper legitimate uh, uh, criminal in prison in San Quentin. And he got involved with a movie shoot that was happening in San Quentin and came out and became a movie star and got involved in drugs. Now he's basically become a drugs counselor and an addiction specialist. But anyway, so at one point in his career, Danny Trejo starts realizing that he's like, like a star and life is amazing. And he goes and like, everybody knows who this guy is. Well, not everybody, <laughs> Trejo. <laughs> so everybody knows who this guy is. And he arrives at this cocktail function. And, you know, he thought, oh, I'm arriving at this kind of thing at the school or the church or whatever it was. And nobody like, there was nothing special. And nobody put anything on. And he got a shit seat at the back and things like this. And he started all like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? And it didn't work out well for him. But the line he said at the end, well, his friend turned around and said this thing to him. He said, and he said, what my lesson was that day is it's okay for the world to think that you're a rock star. It's just not okay for you to think you're a rock star. And this is what happens. At some point, we start thinking, hey, that like Matt, like I'm the famous podcast guy. Everybody fucking thinks I'm amazing. And it's okay for me to think of my friend, Matt, or even this person, Matt, is this amazing podcast guy that's done thousands of shows and knows every entrepreneur. He's more connected than a bowl of spaghetti, but it's not okay for you to think that about yourself, right? That's, that's a problem. And this is what, you know, sometimes people say nice things to me as a speaker. I know that I'm just like an introverted dad and husband who sometimes gets the opportunity to get onto stage. Mm. Uh, and this is where entitlement comes from. I think entitlement is linked to that. And so because my expectations of my self view of myself isn't this crazy thing, adversity doesn't feel that difficult because there is no entitlement there because I don't think I'm a rock star. Does that make, I mean, I don't know if I'm doing a stretch, but I feel like they're connected. Yeah, exactly. It's the same that. thing. Like I was, I, I actually speak quite a lot on podcasts these days. I'm being interviewed like three or four times a week. So I've actually gotten pretty comfortable now with like, remembering all the things that have that i've learned you know after doing all these shows and um w one of the guys asked me yesterday said to me like what is there like one thing like over and above things like perseverance and shit like that or uh, you know asking better questions that that you know if you feel is a consistent thing between people who are actually successful so these are people who um, have actually gone through adversity like hectic adversity like amazing hardcore shit and somehow still persevered and somehow still built their their dream and I said to him, well, I've never, ever met anyone successful on my show. And I've had billionaires, you know, just amazing people, basically. And I've, I've never met anyone who sees themselves as successful, not one. And so even if they have a billion dollars in the bank, they don't go, oh, I'm a super ding dong billionaire guy. You know what I mean? Uh, they, they're always hungry for that next thing. Does that make sense? Like I met uh, Jordan Zimmerman. I mean, that guy's got more money than God. And I said to him, you know, first of all, he said, I don't do podcasts. And I said to him, well, why are you here then? He says, well, when I saw you had done 850 episodes, I knew you the type of guy I wanted to spend time with. So I got chatting to him afterwards and he doesn't need to work, but he's still do doing his thing. He sold his company for like, I don't know, just a lot of money to WPP. Um, and now he's still active in his business and he's like 65. He, you know, he could have quit like 15, 20 years ago, moved to the Bahamas, you know, super yachts, Bolivian cocaine, bunch of Russian supermodels, but he chose not to. Um, and he's still generating wealth outside of his business. Like he told me, like one of the most, uh, one of his most uh, predictable assets, he buys caravan uh, infrastructure. So basically you pull in, you know, you pull in your caravan and you park it on a lot and it has a number. Power. 
chain of power and you rent it. He owns 60,000 caravan slots, dude, across America. 60 fucking thousand. I never thought of that. I always assumed somebody owned the whole lot. So you're saying no. you can timeshare like five of those squares. Pretty much. You bet. So he basically owns all this like la like land. It's like the most ridiculous thing. Wow. It's like there's no risk, very low maintenance, and he's just sitting there making cash. You know? That's so my point being though, if he wasn't hungry, he wouldn't even do that. Does that make sense? Like he wouldn't keep doing the things that that he knows how to do, which is to generate wealth. So, and you know, if, if this, and again, in this adversity thing, if you generate that kind of generational wealth, like you don't give a fuck about adversity. You can like give it the bird because you have all of this wealth, right? You can just disconnect from adversity for the rest of time, but he no, chooses not to. And, and, but, and, but, and, and, and that yeah. for me is what makes people successful is this, I'm going to continuously be hungry for that thing. So, so there's two postures for me. The, the first thing, Matt, is, is what is driving that, right? So, so what is the motivation driver for him to keep going? So it could be the fact that he, he, may be, he may be humble and he may not see himself as this you know, very wealthy man, whatever it is, but it, it could be something else that's driving him, right? And it could, just, it could be positive. I'm not saying it's negative. It could be like the desire to learn or the desire to make impact with Pushaw. But the thing which is amazing to me is, is that I looked at all these, these famous rich people that have committed suicide over the last... 20 years, right? Like the, the Robin Williamses and, and all the rock stars and all the guys. And you go like, they don't need to work. None of those guys need to work. They can all stop working, right? And yet they are miserable and they live in these amazing places and they have the cocaine and strippers and they're miserable, right? So the, the money thing for me is, is not the indication of whether you deal with adversity. Yes, it makes your life easier, categorically. Your life and on many levels will be easier. But in the same vein, it creates a different kind of adversity for you, right? Now you don't trust people. Now you're worried about your money. So the, the wealth itself creates different pressures and adversities. So it, it's it's obviously dependent on per person and their, their circumstance. But the thing that Richard went, or, or I think Richard said, or you said was, he no longer has to work. And he no longer has to work for money. For money. But he has to work for something else, okay? It's either his drive, or he has to work because it keeps him sane and he realizes that. And it's the, it's the retirement thing. The, the people that retire early die early. Like there's real value in, in solving problems and, and dealing with people and in, engaging and, and, you know, adding value somewhere. So adversity is not, is not necessarily solved by money. I, I don't believe it. I'm not saying that that's all you were saying. But sometimes the richest people in the world have the most adverse lives. Like they have really difficult lives, money or no money, good business or no business. Um, I, I look at, you look at a lot of the interviews around Elon Musk. And, and he talks about, you don't want to be me. He says, my life is a mess. My head doesn't stop. I can't stop moving forward. My life is chaos. Three marriages, multiple kids from different women. That, that's not a happy existence, right? So he's got a different kind of adversity. Yes, he doesn't worry about money the next day, but he's got a whole different set of, of challenges. And Dude. how does he deal with it? Eh? It's funny. I was thinking of this when Matt was, was speaking. And so like I spend... You know, when, when I let the voice in my head, you know, his, his name's Tony. I actually figured that out it's on a mushroom journey. I can't remember if I told you guys. But so now I know his name's Tony. I'm like, fuck you, Tony. And so, so I have to tell myself, fuck you, Tony, all the time. But when, when I'm Tony. Oh my God, Danny Treo. Hey, Danny Treo. Yeah, you're the Danny <laughs> guy. So we've got this dude in her head. It's probably somewhere back there. And he'll be, he will be like, oh, you're not enough. You're a failure. And uh, I spend a lot of my time thinking I'm a failure. But reading Elon Musk's. Um, biography the the isaacson one i can categorically yeah. with absolutely i will go on to any debate with anybody in the world and i will say i am not successful right i think success is payable upon death just like failure which is good news i am success bound okay but i am more successful than elon musk as being on, on unless you want to elon musk's circle goes like this uh, his van is, uh, let's say that's the center and that's the, that's the, the full success. Elon Musk circle is right in the middle like that with one really, really, really big spike on, on work. On, on right? money. He is very yeah. unsuccessful. And the other dynamics of like being a family and having hobbies and having balance and being healthy and being a good, you know, like all of those things. Like I would back myself on all of those metrics. On I would average. back myself as being more successful than Elon Musk. The one metric, which is, you know, how much money can you make? Uh, he absolutely, he's got it. 
But that is yeah. not even close to me. Like I would absolutely say, and that's why, to your point, Brent, I think some people do go and and you know top themselves and things. I think it's it's not easy because mm. they re recognize that, right? They built a one-dimensional um, uh, pillar of success. View. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And if, and that's okay if if that if that's all you want, then good for you, okay? But I think that. Well, I say good for them, good for him, right? He's not happy. Does anybody really want that, though? Is that is that true? No, 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 no. So, so if you if you genuinely find happiness in the direction that you 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 weight your your view of success, if you genuinely find happy, good for you, right? So if if he was genuinely a happy individual with that, oh, one, but then the circle would be big. No, okay, but what I'm saying is, some people have a much smaller set of paths or, or slices oh, that they're yes. trying to fill. Okay. If he if he finds if someone finds happiness with one slice, i.e. finance and, and work and cash, and are genuinely happy, good for them. I don't believe that's the average, right? Like it's a bit psychopathic. So if you can exactly, if right. you could literally just exist that how much money can I make? Uh, mm. that's borderline sociopathic. It's just, mm. it's as dysfunctional as wanting to stay home all day long and just do nothing, just read books or play video games. Mm. Okay, so here's the thing. So going back to the adversity thing. So he, so if, so if, Elon's probably got more adversity, quote unquote, than most other people because he's generated all of this wealth. So what would you, and again, like adversity comes at a price. Like he can't have balance. He can't, dude. It's well, it's relative adversity, right? Like, yeah, It exactly. doesn't mean more so, to him. No, but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, for him, adversity uh, is essential or what have you, but it also comes at a price. Like, I mean, his, me his media personality, what people say to him, you know, mm. the, the stress and the pressure and all that shit. Um, and yet he continues to be who he is. He doesn't, he perseveres through that thing. You know, remember that story where, um, you know, SpaceX had that final rocket launch and Tesla was on, on the back foot and everything was, he was basically going to be, lose all of his wealth. And then, and yet still he went through that period and then, you know, in hindsight, now he's super successful. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think he's been able to, or what is the, what is there? Is he like a principle or a mantra or something? So that, I think that you know, Matt, him specifically is probably the one of the worst examples, right? Because he is not by any means the average business owner or entrepreneur in the world, right? Like he's not. And, and by his own account, Asperger's, he's not like normal in the in the normal sense of the word right so oh, the same way hashtag cancelled can we even have Brent on the show anymore no, i'm no. looking forward to the <laughs> apology on hi hi i can't wait for you reading your statement oh, out to people. <laughs> <laughs> okay no but what i'm saying but what i'm saying to you is, is that he's, he's a bad measure against any other average you can't talk about him on on, sure. on the average but, but what you'll find is is that Certain people don't have that pain switch, like they're missing a piece of their brain where they, they don't have fear or they have a unbelievable delusional self-belief or, or the drive to prove a point. I mean, we've talked about this before briefly. I remember talking about it, but when I was having all the, the trauma in my youth with my father, I went to therapy and my therapist said to me, you realize the reason that you work so hard and are trying so hard to make money and a success is called the big fuck you. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, all you're doing is going, fuck you, dad. I'm going to show you I can do it. And that's because he made one statement. The day I started that business, he went, good luck. I hope you got a head for business. Gave me the thumbs up and walked out. And for 17 years, mm -hmm. I was like, I am going to show him. That was my motivation. Now, Elon Musk might have a similar motivation for X, Y, father. Seem to. Someone. But I also I, think I that I that's the how book. extended to the world. So he is, when we talked about fueled by adversity, adversity to be yeah. enjoyed, not endured. That, yes. well, you know, and I, I don't know, like I, I finished that book thinking, and I, I don't know if I like him or dislike him, but I certainly wouldn't ignore him. But like that, mm. uh, you know, if you want to leave Twitter, fuck, you go fuck yourself, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. That's adversity. If, if that guy needed something to fuel his passion to make Twitter work, it wasn't the status quo. It wasn't us on Twitter saying, oh, this is so much better or so much worse. It was, he needed an enemy, right? He mm. needs a Bond villain or he is the Bond villain, but he needs the person to be able, he is fueled by adversity. And so when those advertisers came back and said they don't want to be there, I promise you that's what drove him. He's like, I can't let you in. We're playing this now. This is the board mm. game. The victory condition is I'm proving you wrong. Boom. Now he's got a game to play. And yep. I think adversity, like that's that's the entrepreneurial drive, right? 
So how do you enjoy Often. adversity then? Like for you guys, I mean, let's, let's drop Elon for a moment. Think about like your own lives. You well, know, I mean, and- we're always having something meaningful to solve for. So very, very quick, 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 quick deviation. I'm going to throw it to you guys. Uh, during COVID, before COVID, you guys know I'm obsessed with board games. I've got over a thousand board games. And for years, if you saw me from like 15 to 19, if, 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 I, if we were cornered for five minutes flat, I was, I was forcing you to play a game. Right? Yeah. And, and uh, during COVID, they had lockdown. And I've got all of these board games. And I've got my wife and children here who'd often play games with me. And I thought, well, this is going to be easy. But I didn't play any games. And I couldn't understand why. And then I did. And then I realized board games, my business, everything was going well. I had no debt. The business was working. My speaking was doing well. Everything was just kind of on, on a rails. And so I didn't have anything meaningful to solve for. And so every lunch and every dinner, I got to sit down and play a game and go to combat and get my brain trying to solve something. During COVID, I had to save my business. By the end of the day, I had problem-solving fatigue. I didn't want any other games because I've been playing my business all day long. And so now the canary in the coal mine for me is if I'm finding myself trying to play games every day, I know that I've run out of meaningful problems to solve. And so I seek out good problems. Mm. So, so Matt, yeah. to answer your question personally, um, I'm goals driven different from rich, right? Like rich guys, I've got a daily goal. I can think of nothing worse than setting a daily goal. Like it's just not the way I'm wired, right? For me, I have this, I have a long-term like goal and it's often a lot of it is driven around savings and security because that's my, my background. Like I want to be financially secure. So I'm driven by that. But for me, the pain, I find that when, when I'm under pressure and I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You go to board games when you're the opposite. I go to my bank account, right? All my investments. And I look at the numbers and go, this is why I'm doing it because I've got a number in mind where I know that at that point I'm, I back off. I'm going to back off. And, and there's, for me, it's a number by 52, so I can work half day for the rest of my life. That's what I want to do. Like, that's categorically where I am. And the sooner I can get to that number, the sooner I can take the, the pedal off. So for me, the reason I endure is because I have a belief that there's a goal that's meaningful to me. And yeah. I, I run a small business. It's just me, right? Like, I don't have a team. I'm not impacting people internally. I think I'm helping my clients. But the reality is, is that I endure because I have a belief that I want to achieve something for myself, which is a very enjoy, deep driver. Because right? I, I think you do enjoy. I don't think it's enduring. So I enjoy every single day. And then realize at the end of the day, how exhausted I am. That's, that's endurance. It's like the, whew, I feel finished. I'm so tired. I love the engagement. It, it, it fuels me all day long. Like these engagements, I love them. I can give you so much energy. But, you know, you do this for, for six to eight hours a day. And at the end of the day, you're like, you're exhausted. Doing that day in and day out becomes quite an endurance. It becomes, it's not adverse. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a terrible thing. And it's by choice, right? I have control. I can back it off at any point. But I'm driven by that goal. And the funny thing was, is that I'm, I'm mildly concerned that if I hit that number earlier or hit it at my planned date, then what? Like the plan is to slow down. But I just said to you, you retire, you die. Like then what? So mm. I have this thing that I believe in, but I do worry about post that, you know, achieving that number, eh? achieving that, that yeah, big so condition I got for a, me. I got a story for last year. So last year was a very ad, adversarial year. <laughs> Is that what you say? Uh, yes. But it sucked, it sucked for me a lot of the time because I, were, I didn't have clarity. I wasn't clear on what I was mm. building and why I was building it. And I think when, you, when you're having adversity or you're going through it and you don't have clarity on what you're building and you don't have like a vision to work towards, like you have a number, Rich, you solve like for, uh, problems in a meaningful way uh, or what have you. you know? So for me, now this year, I was like, you know what, fuck this. I'm just going to create books for, for busy business leaders. That's it. We've got this amazing system that creates a best-selling book 300% faster and a 50% less cost than anyone else in North America. It's a big market. It's thought leadership. You know, I've written three books. In fact, the last two books I wrote used the same system. You know, I wrote uh, Secrets of Influence in 10 days. I mean, fuck. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do that. But before I made that choice, I, I didn't believe that books was something that, that I wanted to solve for, to your point, Rich. Uh, but now it is. And so just repositioned the whole company. And it's amazing what clarity will do for your motivation. Mm. It's amazing. Because now I'm looking at the business in an entirely new paradigm, like entirely new. 
I'm thinking about it differently. I'm looking for the right partners. You know, I'm looking for the right uh, people in the right bus seats, you know. Um, and so clarity for me is a great antidote to adversity. Yeah. Well, uh, because yeah. it's a victory condition, right? Mm. So all that, ha all that adversity does, when you have a victory condition, a strategic destination, all that adversity does is like a barrier between you and there. You, all you have to do is carve out a new path to victory. If you don't have clarity of that victory condition, you're lost. So that's where that helps you. Anyway, boys, <laughs> this yep, was, we got this was real. <laughs> yeah, man. It's yep. always good chatting to you. Sorry, it's a shorter one than usual, but uh, good to see you. We've got to do this more often. Awesome. Mm. Chat to you guys soon. Okay.